Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Ron Plain analyzes hog markets. Brad Lumen discusses the Livestock Indemnity Program and the progress on a new farm bill. Rick Rasby talks about sampling forages before feeding them to livestock. And Al Dutcher gives his weekly weather forecast. With the USDA back at the wheel, Monday marked the resumption of weekly crop progress reports. The agency says 39% of U.S. corn and 63% of U.S. soybeans have been harvested. Nebraska is ahead of the average with 80% of its beans out, but behind the norm with only 32% of its corn picked. Presumably, progress was delayed last week after heavy rains. That precipitation, though, helped move more of the state out of drought. 13% of Nebraska is now out of drought classification according to the latest UNL drought monitor. That's the highest amount of the state in normal status since June 19, 2012. Before we get to our market analysis with Ron Plain, there is an update on the porcine epidemic diarrhea virus. A team of scientists from multiple universities this week announced they had traced the virus to China. Their report found the three U.S. strains are most closely related to a strain found in 2012 in an eastern Chinese province. The scientists said the molecular clock analysis is consistent with the time frame of the outbreaks, December 2010 in China and May 2013 in the U.S. The U.S. PEDV strains also were found to share unique genetic features with a coronavirus found in bats, which doesn't necessarily indicate but provides evidence for potential transmission from different species. There are currently 18 U.S. states positive for the porcine epidemic diarrhea virus. Nebraska is not one of them. We started this week's market analysis segment with Ron by asking how he thinks PEDV has affected U.S. hog numbers. Well, for the Farms that have broken with it, it can be devastating. Uh, death loss uh, for young pigs, uh, at times over 99%. So it's a, a very uh, uh, Im impactful at the farm level. As far as national level, we thought we would see uh, some indication in the September hog and pig report number, but uh, pigs per litter was up 2%, set a new all-time record high. So uh, not a whole lot of evidence there of an impact. Uh, we do get uh, test uh, data from laboratories uh, regularly and uh, uh, we've got uh, 700 plus farms uh, uh, that are confirmed with the disease, but there's probably a fair amount of double counting in that, those numbers, so again, it's pretty fuzzy, Jeff. You think there's some error in those numbers, you mean? Well, no, uh, there's no real way of uh, determining whether it's a follow-up test on a farm. Say you broke okay. back in June and in uh, October you retest to see if you, you've still got it. Uh, that's likely to be counted as two farms rather than one farm testing twice. I understand what you mean there. Uh, as you look at the herd size, what do you expect to see there as we go forward and that, that corn and soybean crop starts to roll in and those feed prices lower? Do you expect that producers might try to expand here? Well, history says uh, uh, producers can only stand profit so long before they start saving guilt. So, uh, the market hog inventory in uh, September 1 was up three-tenths of one percent, uh, fairing intentions uh, uh, up a little sh shy of uh, one percent, but uh, more pigs per litter. So, yes, we're probably going to see the herd expand uh, producers uh, with uh, a sharply lower feed costs are, are going to be in a position where I think some of them are going to think about expanding. Uh, the real unknown and uncertainty and risk uh, is like you started this uh, interview with, the PED virus. 
Yeah, for those uh, Farrow to Finish producers, what are they looking at for a break-even margin right now? Well, uh, we've gone from break-evens uh, above uh, uh, 70 cents a pound on a live weight basis to uh, under 60 cents, at least going forward, uh, at current feed prices. So, uh, 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 12, 15 cent a pound lower cost of production going forward than what we've lived with for the past year. What's your forecast for those feed prices? Uh, where do you expect corn to be and then how affordable can soybean meal be? Well, with respect to uh, corn, we're probably going to see prices, uh, uh, you know, under between uh, four and a quarter and, and four and a half a bushel for a lot of the crop here uh, uh, during harvest. Uh, seasonally, you expect prices to move up as uh, we go forward. We're probably going to see the same type of thing for a while on soybeans, but it uh, uh, looks like South America is going to have a, a pretty good size uh, soybean crop, and that should put downward pressure on bean meal prices uh, later on in the, in the uh, winter and early spring. As we've seen for a long time now, the uh, supply of beef is very tight. Uh, as it relates to consumers in the grocery store at the meat counter, describe to me what that competition will look like here uh, between pork, beef, and chicken. Well, uh, there's probably going to see uh, some growth in, in chicken numbers and more uh, uh, chicken in uh, the meat case, and uh, that'll keep their prices from, from rising. Uh, both beef and pork set all-time record highs uh, in the grocery store the last two months. Uh, beef's going to keep going higher. There's no way that we can increase beef numbers very quickly. Uh, incentive is to save heifers and expand the herd. That's going to tighten up the beef supply even more, so uh, it's going to be record beef prices and again in 2014 uh, and uh, a little bit more and a little bit cheaper chicken and for pork uh, uh, depending on how numbers go we may see very similar prices next year to what we had this year. As you mentioned in your written analysis uh, at the beginning of this week or the end of last week uh, cutout values are extremely high for pork. Uh, what do you what's your opinion on what we'll see here for the live market and then uh, also on a carcass weight basis as we go forward? Yeah. Uh, it's, we kind of got a dilemma. Uh, weights are up. Uh, carcass uh, uh, weights have been very high. It was a cool summer and we've got lower cost corn, so that's not expected. Slaughter numbers have been running below year ago levels. That's not quite what we expected from the pig report. So it's a tighter supply. That's kept uh, carcass prices of hogs uh, in uh, very high 80s to low 90s, uh, which is very good for October. Well, seasonally, we should get the lowest prices of the year sometime in early December. I'm guessing we're going to drop on down into the lower 80s uh, before we bounce back, but still a uh, uh, quite profitable set of numbers for hog producers. Live market follows it too? Yes, uh, on a live weight basis, uh, we're going to see prices uh, slide from the uh, uh, mid-60s down to probably a few days in the upper 50s before rebounding early in uh, 2014. Next week, we'll look at corn and soybean markets with Roy Smith. UNL Extension says the recent snowstorm in northwest Nebraska killed more than 2,200 cattle. Across the border, Sylvia Christen, the executive director of the South Dakota Stock Growers Association, told the Rapid City Council the rain and snow directly hit 16 South Dakota counties. Christen says while there isn't a specific count of dead cattle, she believes the South Dakota governor's office approximation of 30,000 dead livestock could be half the actual total. Kristen says the direct impact from losses might reach $500 million. She estimates the indirect cost could tally nearly $1.7 billion. As we mentioned in our previous episode, these affected farmers and ranchers currently have little help from the federal government with the absence of a livestock indemnity program. UNL Extension Public Policy Specialist Brad Lubin joined us Wednesday to discuss the details of that program and if producers can anticipate seeing it again with the eventual passing of a new farm bill. Well, we expect the Livestock Indemnity Program to help us out with these tremendous cattle losses due to the blizzard, but we can back up and look at that program. It helps producers cover death losses in the herd uh, when we have death losses above normal, such as we have with this event. It's part of disaster assistance that we've historically seen passed in Congress year after year. In the 08 Farm Bill, it was permanently authorized uh, as part of a portfolio of disaster assistance programs. So it's there to help producers when we have these losses occur. Uh, unfortunately, the 08 bill only authorized it through 11, uh, and all of those disaster programs then essentially fell out of authority. They were reauthorized with the extension of the Farm Bill here at the beginning of 2013, 
they've now technically expired again. All this awaits final completion on a farm bill before we can finally get back to uh, offering assistance in those programs. What was the coverage in the OA farm yes. program? Yeah. How did it work? Uh, essentially, producers could file uh, for assistance uh, for a percentage of the market value of the animals that they lost due to these uh, disaster events. So you have to have good records of inventories, uh, inventories lost, mm -hmm. death losses, uh, records of the weather event, in this case the, the blizzard event, or last summer some of the death losses in the feedlot that might have occurred due to, uh, uh, due to the heat and humidity conditions. Uh, you have to have good records of those things that have happened. Uh, and and then be prepared to apply for assistance at the Farm Service Agency office. Now there was an aspect of this that kind of came into play last year when the drought hit and forages right. were in such short supply, right? right? Part of the disaster portfolio wasn't just the Livestock Indemnity Program for death losses, but the Livestock Forage Disaster Program for essentially losses of grazing capacity mm -hmm. and forage quantity. Uh, that was a disaster assistance program that triggered automatically based on what level of drought a producer was facing. Um, certainly we would have would have had great need for that assistance in 2012 uh, and yet because of the lack of authority and the lack of funding uh, it's not yet available. We eventually expect a farm bill to get done mm -hmm. that will retroactively authorize and fund that assistance backing up through 2012. Now, if so that... producers might eventually be applying for forage loss assistance sure. from what losses they had back in 2012. They should be applying for death loss assistance uh, here for these losses in 2013. Eventually, we expect that uh, assistance to be on the way to producers. But the key part is that if the assistance would not be immediate, right? Those checks would not be cut. Checks the next day. Type checks of don't happen the next day, but just as soon as we have a farm bill and funding uh, for that portion, mm -hmm. you can envision the USDA rolling out a program and offering assistance. It's really contingent upon getting this farm bill to completion. We know now that the uh, farm bill, the Senate and House right. are scheduled to meet next Wednesday afternoon. When they say it's going to committee, just explain to me what that right. means. Well, recall the, the, the years now of, of progress and failed progress on this bill. Uh, watching it in 11, watching it in 12, watching it in 13. The Senate voted for a farm bill uh, to go to uh, committee uh, in, back in uh, June. The House tried to vote on a full farm bill in June and failed, and they ended up voting on a farm-only portion in July. And then they came back in September and passed a nutrition title bill in, in September. The House has put the farm-only bill and the nutrition bill back together for purposes of negotiation with the Senate, and thus we proceed to a conference committee. The conference committee reviews essentially differences between House and Senate legislation in an attempt to produce a compromise version, that would come back to uh, both the House and the Senate for a final up or down vote. Since you've become sort of a farm bill uh, deadline expert yes. here, yeah. uh, the permanent legislation that it now reverts back to, some groups are saying that uh, they don't want that taken out because then in the future, if one were to expire, you could still have something to fall back on. Correct. Explain to me how the permanent legislation works. Well, permanent legislation has been the hammer that forces a real conversation every few years on a farm bill. Uh, we talk about permanent legislation, we refer to 1949. Uh, there's language from 38 and there's language from 49 that is officially on the books only to be superseded by modern day farm bills, but never technically repealed, just superseded. When a modern farm bill expires, that old language is still on the books. One proposal that has showed up in the House version would be essentially updating that permanent title to the 2013 version of the legislation. So instead of the 49 legislation being the last one that doesn't expire, it would be the 13 bill that doesn't expire. Well, that makes some sense. It's more uh, more efficient uh, program, it, it more feasible, uh, more palatable, et cetera. Um, but if we have a 13 bill that doesn't expire, then come 2018, it's time to debate this thing again. There's not the same impetus to get the debate done in 18 if you revert to 13, then there is if you're in 18 and you might revert to 1949. Uh, it's, it's a push to actually keep the oldest language on the books just because it's a hammer. Again, the Farm Bill is scheduled for conference meeting Wednesday afternoon. Regarding further assistance to farmers and ranchers in South Dakota, the USDA said this week it's offering special sign-up through the NRCS Environmental Quality Incentives Program. 
That sign-up runs through November 15th and will help producers dispose of livestock carcasses, replace destroyed fencing, and rebuild shelter belts and other conservation practices destroyed by the storm. A new wheat variety geared to Nebraska's dryland production has been released. In the October Nebraska Farmer, you can read about Freeman Wheat, named in honor of Daniel Freeman, who was the first person to file for a homestead under the Homestead Act of 1862. Based on University of Nebraska-Lincoln variety trials, Freeman was either the top producer or in the highest yielding group in dryland production in southeast, southwest, west central, and western Nebraska. UNL wheat breeder Stephen Benziger says Freeman appears to be widely adapted to the northern Great Plains and has also performed well in USDA regional nurseries. You can read more about Freeman wheat in the October Nebraska Farmer. UNL Extension plant pathologist Tamara Jackson Zim says now is a good time to think about selecting the right corn variety for next season. Growers might be more aware of disease issues now since they're rolling through the fields during harvest. Tamara says seed selection can be one of the most economical things a producer can do when it comes to disease management. Knowing which fields are higher risk for some diseases, uh, for example, both Goss's wilt and gray leaf spot pathogens overwinter or survive from year to year in infected crop residue from the previous year. What that means for producers is that if they've had that disease, if the weather conditions are right, they're going to have the diseases again. And so that's one of the things that you can depend on. And so knowing that these are pretty consistent diseases, selecting hybrids for resistance is just going to be the best way uh, to consistently control them. In fact, the number one factor that affects Goss's wilt development is the rating of the hybrid for Goss's wilt that the company provides. Tamer says growers should look for ratings in seed catalogs and consult with suppliers to help manage any potential disease issues. She advises, though, producers to make sure they know what the ratings mean because they can vastly differ from company to company. This year's Ag at the Crossroads Awards Banquet will honor Jerry Warner and his 41 years with Farmers National. Throughout the day, November 7th, you can hear speakers cover topics including public finance, the state budget, and legislative appropriations. That event will be held at the Lancaster Event Center in Lincoln. The banquet will be held November 6th at UNL's East Campus Union. If you're interested in attending, we'll link to more information on our website. The 2012 drought put a strain on forage supplies, which were already reduced due to drought in Texas the previous year. No matter the type of forage you're using this year or your assumption of its quality, UNL Extension Beef Specialist Rick Rasby says it's probably a good idea to sample and test those forages before feeding. Every year I think that's a good practice because, um, you know, forage quality can vary. Uh, it not only varies amongst the different uh, forages, but also even within a forage because there'll be good quality grass hay and there'll be poor quality grass hay out there and there'll be grass hay that's average and so if you just assume it's average that's probably not uh, the right assumption so you know the, the idea would be to test it and just see where it's at quality wise. You've got your probe with you. Yeah. Explain to me how you're going to go about doing it. Well the, the thing would be is that uh, labs won't take a grab sample uh, especially of hay and so you'll need to use a, a probe and uh, uh, you can get those probably at the extension office. Usually most of them have a, a probe that you can check out. And, and this is the way to get a, uh, 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 an unbiased sample out of that bale. And so the idea would be you need to use a probe. And then the other thing would be is to make sure that you uh, take a, a sample of uh, uh, a representative sample of the hay that you have out there. And so, you know, if you get a, uh, an area that you basically baled up and you have uh, 40 big round bales, you'd probably want to sample somewhere between uh, uh, 12 to 15 of those. And so you sample each of them one time, right? And so then you take the sample and put it into a bag. And, and the idea would be there is to make sure that you label the bag properly so that when it's sent into the lab, they know exactly what sample that you have there and that they, uh, what they're trying to test that against. And most labs are going to uh, have NIR uh, testing, and so uh, they're going to go into the right library to basically compare this feed that you send them uh, to the, the sample in that library. What are the three things that maybe you're most worried about them sampling for? Yeah, I, I, if, if you're a if you're cow-calf, I would sample for moisture and then I'd sample for protein, or at least test for t protein, and then test for uh, energy, and energy in the form of TDN. And so those would be the three biggies. And, uh, you know, if you had summer annuals, I'd sure enough test for nitrates too. Um, it's probably a good idea always to set, test for nitrates in summer annuals. And then just make sure you understand uh, the analysis that they send back, because uh, labs will uh, basically send the uh, 
uh, analysis back in nitrates or nitrate nitrogen and so you want to know, make sure that you know what the toxic level is for either one of those and make sure that you know what they've tested it uh, for and in. As yeah. you go west in this state there were some probably some dry land corn that got burnt up and there could be maybe some nitrate concerns if you use that to pack silage with. Uh, what would the process be if you wanted to test that silage? Well you, you know that's a that's a good point and, and really if, if you had if you had uh, damaged corn in any way shape or form that maybe stunted the uh, growth activity there silage is a good way to, to harvest that because you know, in the in siling process, you'll basically uh, eliminate 40 to 60 percent of the nitrates, and so that would be a good way to to, to basically use that feed or store that feed. And uh, and so, from a silage standpoint, you don't use a probe to test uh, to sample silage. It's a it's a basically a grab sample, and you're going to sample uh, take a sample of more silage than what you need. And basically, what I do is I look at the face of that pit and go to the right side uh, in the middle and the left side and sample uh, top, middle, and bottom. Put it into a bucket, uh, mix it up, put it out onto a piece of paper, mix it up, and then you only need to send in whatever bag they give you from the uh, uh, lab. And so you don't need to send in a, uh, a bushel of, right. of, of silage. <laughs> uh, but the idea would be to continue. To, to uh, mix in, and, uh, and, and sample uh, smaller portions of that. Take it from the thirds. There the you go, the exactly. Uh, yeah. And then they're going to give it back to you and you're going to read it based for maybe if you're using a feedlot on a dry matter basis, correct? Yeah, in both cases, okay. cow, calf, or, or a feedlot, you'd want to look at the dry matter because uh, the nutrients uh, needs for uh, cattle are in dry matter basis. And so uh, the idea would be as you compare your feed that you have, uh, to the dry matter column in that feed analysis. And the, the, the thing is, is that um, if you do it early enough, now if you know where the gaps are, uh, let's say you uh, have a feed that doesn't meet the protein requirement, you can go out and start looking for protein supplements that fit your operation. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist, Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we are again for the weekly forecast. Before we get to the main brunt of a possible snow forecast, let's look at what's happened during this last week. We talked about the cold air moving into the region as we got into this week. It did arrive about 24 hours later than initially forecasted by the models, but the result was the same. Little in the way of any significant moisture, a few isolated sprinkles to light snow showers in portions of northern Nebraska, where almost everybody received nothing in the way of significant moisture. Um, that did help at least with harvest activity weather, but in the same token, that cold air really has dropped our average temperatures for the month in relation to normal. During the first 15 days of the month, pretty much everybody in the state was well above normal in terms of temperatures. This cold stretch of this last 10 days has dropped western Nebraska to around 3 degrees above no or below normal for the month of October. Eastern Nebraska, we're now running 1 to 2 degrees above normal for the month. But with the cool temperatures expected over this next few days and through the end of the month, where expectations will be that October will come in somewhere between a half a degree above normal to about a degree below normal across eastern Nebraska and we'll be looking at three to four degrees below normal for western portions of the state. Now there is a significant storm system that is going to try to develop over the central Rockies and it's going to bring some exceptionally cold air back into the center part of the country as we move through next week. And so let's take a look at the forecast and see what we might expect in terms of its placement of this storm and its impacts on Nebraska in terms of precipitation. First of all, the trough that brought in all this cold weather is now retreating toward the northeast very rapidly and so with this warmer air building in and a trough starting to come into the Pacific Northwest it's going to dive into the Intermountain region. It's going to start lifting up some very nice warm air into our region compared to what we've been experiencing in the last few days. So for western Nebraska we're looking at 60s today across extreme northeastern Nebraska still catching a little bit of this cool air. Temperatures are going to be limited. We're probably looking at the upper 40s to the lower 50s but no precipitation to speak of. Now, As we go into tomorrow, we're going to start to see this system starting to take shape. In advance of it, we're going to see some fairly nice weather. It looks like 50s to mid 50s across extreme northeastern Nebraska, across southern Nebraska, easily into the 60s, and I wouldn't be shocked if we see an isolated 70 in southwestern Nebraska. Now as we go into Monday, this system really starts to dig down into the Great Basin region. It's getting stronger. It's going to have time to lift up moisture into the central and southern plains. So we might see some precipitation breaking out late Monday across the northern portion of the Panhandle. If it occurs during the overnight hours, we might see a little bit of snow. But more importantly, as we get into Tuesday, the system starts to make its bend down into the western Texas and it'll start to shift toward the northeast. 
and therefore with this moisture we're going to see some upslope flow and there's very distinct possibility that the northern half of the panhandle could easily see three to six inches of snowfall. Please pay attention to the weather because the placement of this storm system will have a lot to do with the accumulations in western Nebraska. If this system doesn't dig as far deep or down southward, we could see much more significant snowfall in eastern Wyoming and western Nebraska, but right now it just looks like a moderate snow event. Further east, it looks to be all rain. And we may only see snowfall at night if there is a mixture of rain and snow, but no significant accumulations are expected with this system. Now, as we get into Wednesday, this first system will start to pull east. It's going to pull a little bit of cool air into our region, but more importantly, there's another system that's going to come in and reinforce this trough. And as we, do, as we get into Thursday, you'll see that this trough kind of broadens out, digs in, and this piece of energy shifts through, will give us another shot of moisture in eastern Nebraska with the potential to see some accumulating snowfall from northeast Nebraska through east central Nebraska. We'll just have to wait and see. On Friday, the system starts to pass to our east and a very cold fesh is in its wake. So in terms of temperatures, the roller coaster ride, 60s this weekend for western Nebraska, cooling into the 30s across the northern portion of the state and possible snow. Then we start the gradual warm up before another cool down next Friday. In terms of the 8 to 14 day forecast, the cold air starts to shift below, to the east of us and in terms of precipitation, likewise, precipitation moves east of the state. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews with Ron Plain, Brad Lubin, Tamara Jackson Zims, and Rick Rasby are available individually on the Market Journal website and through our mobile app as part of the October 25th episode. Next week, Roy Smith will be our marketing analyst. Creighton University economist Ernie Goss will discuss the health of the Midwest economy and will look at how, for some, China's changing food diet could be a mixed blessing. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. America's export of soybeans helps the U.S. maintain a positive agricultural trade balance. Nebraska contributes half of its soybeans for export. The protein and oil content in soybeans enhance the growing demand for higher protein diets. The Nebraska Soybean Board promotes research to develop new soybean varieties with higher protein and oil content for major agricultural markets. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.